I'm in my office. I get a call from Mike Stewart. Mike was the man who was running you and United Artists Records and Music Publishing for me. And he said, I got a call from London from Noel Rogers, who runs our publishing company in London. And there's this rock group called the Beatles, and they're interested in making some rock and roll movies. I said, well, they cost. He doesn't know exactly, maybe 60, 70,000 pounds. I said, do we get publishing? We can get some publishing. We get soundtrack albums? We can get soundtrack albums. I said, if we can get those rights, there's nothing to lose because those rights will be worth something, even the movies aren't a hit. And you never know with these kind of things. So I approved a three-picture deal with this group called the Beatles that, of course, I'd never heard of. I remember Brian getting very excited about the fact that the Beatles would be, had been offered a movie. And, of course, he'd done a deal with United Artists, not for one, but for three, as a kind of package deal. And like quite a few of Brian's things, it wasn't all that great a deal. In fact, I believe the movie was made for less money than the first album of the Beatles created. When the Beatles were first told by Brian Epstein, I can set up a movie for you, um, they didn't want to do it because they were looking at past track records of the movie business and the whole standard of pop music on film was not good in the, the, the early 60s. They had no storylines at all. You would have a parade of guest artists coming on and performing, uh, not even their hit singles, but uh, you know a fairly bad single written specially for the soundtrack of the movie. So the press weren't at all moved by the fact that there was going to be a film made. Britain was just over the moon at this fantastic phenomenon, the Beatles, and they were just as excited, not big-headedly, but look what's happened to us, four kids from Liverpool. And of course, they just exploded. The big challenge to me was suddenly this three-picture deal we had with this group in Liverpool that I'd never heard of before turned out to be a group with what looked like was going to be a very, very successful act. And of course, there we were, already in business with. And that's when the decision as to who was going to make the movie became essentially, I mean, was the, was the heart of the matter. United Artists approached me and asked me if I'd make a film for them. And I thought they had a script or, 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 a, or a book or something. And I said, what have you got? And they said, well, we want to make a movie with the Beatles. I said, sure, I'd be happy to. So they introduced me to Brian, and I guess he thought I was okay. And next thing I do, I had to meet the Beatles. Well, the first meeting I had with him, Brian uh, Epstein was supposed to bring them to my office in London, and he showed up on time. But the Beatles, they didn't come. Brian came, and he apologized. He said, I'm afraid uh, we'll have to do it some other time, but they're over at uh, EMI Studios at Abbey Road in on a session that another group that Brian had managed. So I have to go over there to meet them. So I said, well, can I go with you? And he said, certainly. So we jumped in a taxi, and he said, well, let's stop by their apartment here in London first. And sure enough, they all came down looking for a taxi. So they jumped into our taxi, and you know London taxis are only for four, so there are six of us in there. And I thought I was in the middle of a Marx Brothers movie. Um, every time the taxi stopped, they'd grab all the newspapers that had Beatle headlines, which they did. And I asked the Beatles, when could we start filming? And John opened up his little diary and he said, well, we're going to the Bahamas to, for a holiday. And then in February, he said, we're going to go to your country. We're going to go to New York and do something called the Ed Sullivan Show. And I said, well, that'll be fine while you're in the uh, Bahamas write at least six new songs for our picture. And John said, well, what's the film about? And I said, I don't know. We haven't got a writer yet. And he said, well, what kind of songs do we write? And I said, Beatles songs. I don't know, two up-tempo, two ballads. I don't know, write six new Beatles songs. And John said, you have a director in mind? I said, yes, another American over here named Richard Lester. And he said, what has he done? And I said, well, he's done some very good television stuff with the Goons. Now, the Goons were uh, an English comedy group that predated the uh, Monty Python group, and Dick had directed their television, and I knew that the Beatles were goon fans. So when I said Dick Lester, they said, well, get him. And that's how it all started. I knew Dick through his work with Spike Milligan and Peter Sellers and the goons, which, of course, because I made all their records. 
And Dick Lester was a, an unconventional type of director. He'd grown up in the world of advertising films and shortcuts and all sorts of things. And that kind of led to A Hard Day's Night. So I was quite expecting an unusual kind of movie. And I was glad we, he, he was on board because I, I certainly didn't want a, another summer holiday. I went to Dick and I said, OK, I want you to make the Beatles movie. And he was very intrigued. He says, what do you think it should be? I said, I don't care. It's your responsibility to decide what kind of movie it is, how to make the boys work. Tell me who you want to hire to write this script. Come back with it, and whatever you do, I'm sure we're going to want to go. So the entire creative input as to what this movie should be and how to maximize the talents of this extraordinary group of young men came from Dick Lester, Alan Owen, and Walter Shenson. I think the Beatles were more interested in not being like the other films than I was because I don't think I had seen that many of them. Um, I did know deep down inside me that I would wanted it to be as natural an experience for them as possible. We were allowed to do it if it cost under £200,000. We were to shoot in March and we had to be in the cinemas in the beginning of July. I met them in October, the Beatles in October 63. I proposed a writer from Liverpool. They accepted me because I was a poor piano player and therefore they at least felt that I would understand where an eight bar phrase should be and how I could cut round it. They accepted Alan Owen as the writer because he seemed to be able to produce a sound that they could manage to do. And uh, as they say pathetically, the rest is history. I saw an outline. I don't remember seeing a script. I, I, can you imagine what a script of Hard Day's Night would have looked like? I mean, it would have been 14 pages long and a lot of stage directions. It didn't make any difference. I trusted Dick. He was finding his way. He was dealing with the boys. There was going to be an album. God be with you. Then Walter Shenson, Alan Owen and I went to Paris to the George Sank, where they were doing one of their first concerts in Paris and watched them in their hotel rooms, in their cars, backstage doing interviews, and in essence the film wrote itself. This is the first weekend I got to know them, and this was the first put-down I got. It was wonderful, because I arrived at the hotel in, the, in uh, Grafton Street, went upstairs, and I was parched. I really needed a, a beer, very badly. So I said to Paul, um, Paul, um, is there any uh, chance of a beer? And he said, oh, oh, you want a beer, do you? Eh? Hey? Oh, no, he wants a beer. And Ringo said, oh, does he want a beer? And George said, oh, he you would, wouldn't he? And so and so. And then he picked up the phone and he said, excuse me, room service, could you send, what sort of a beer do you want, Alan? And I said, a Phoenix. All right. Could you send up a Phoenix beer, please, and four large scotches and four Cokes? <laughs> and that was, from that moment on, I knew I was, going, I was in for put-downs. I remember John saying of Alan Owen, who was a Welshman who wrote about Ireland and came from Liverpool, the trouble with you is you're just a professional Liverpudlian. And, and Alan said, well, it's better than being an amateur one, John. I wouldn't take any credit away from Alan. I thought the script, when, the first one I read, I thought was brilliant, much too long and much too f scripted. But it was great. I don't know another writer that could have been as perceptive as that in the short time allowed. Uh, they did a certain amount of ad-libbing, maybe 5 or 10%. But I've got Alan's script, and all the ad-libs that you think are ad-libs were written by him. And then from then on, it was just the, the madness of getting ready to shoot, because they then went over to do the Ed Sullivan show, and their personalities and their success took a fairly big leap forward in terms of the world's awareness. So that by the time we started, our, our biggest problems in filming were the tactical ones of how can we not let people know where we're going to be filming. I think it was the day where they were starting at Paddington Station. I heard they were starting each day at a different place and I got on the train and of course lots of kids start screaming. It's just hysteria. You, know, you can't imagine what it's like. And I remember they were so happy. They're having such a good time and it was so raw and so fresh. That's what I was missing with all these other things I've seen before. And it was great. It was fantastic. 
Have a good mind to thump you, Shake. Hey, if you're going to have a Barney, can I hold your coat? He started it. I did not, you did. On the first morning, we were sitting at tables in the restaurant car in the train, and I was sitting opposite George doing a crossword or something as usual, and the train stopped, and down below there was what had been the bed of a stream, but it had dried out, and both sides of it were thick, thick, thick bulrushes for about 20 feet, and some kids had obviously been running along, trampling them down, and George just said very quietly to nobody in particular, ''Oh, look, there's Moses.'' I started to laugh and I thought, I think I'm going to get up with these fellas <laughs> because they all had great senses of humour. The old fella said that could he have these pictures and Norm said no and all I said was, well, why not be big about it? And your grandfather pointed out that Shake was always being taller than me just to spite me. I knew it, he started it. Hey, Polly, would you ever sign one of them for us? Uh, come ahead, Shake. When we finished the first day's shooting on the train, they had been dropped off in a field outside of London. The train came back into the Marlebone station. And out of nowhere, again, children were starting to run towards the train. At that point, our clapper loader, who was about 24 years old with the same sort of hairdo, came smiling down, having finished the first day's work with, um, with all the negative. And the screaming started. And he panicked, and he thought, I, I've got to outrun them. And he started to run, and he was carrying eight or nine tins of film, and they caught up with him, and the film got dropped, and we lost half the first day's shooting negative. It was, it was lying around under the tracks, and he ran for his life. Our philosophy was we chose the filmmakers we wanted to be in business with. We approved the scripts, we approved the budgets. They had final cut as long as the film stayed within the budget and followed the script, which we'd approved. We approved the cast, etc. I had no idea what was going on, other than the fact that Dick was making the film. The word was kind of, well, this is a strange little movie. And I was just waiting to see the film when it was finished. I certainly knew it was having a certain style, but that's great. I mean, it, it should be something different. The sense that there was a slightly surreal element to the film was something that was very important to try to get in. And I wanted to prepare the audience for the fact that they would be playing cards, for example, in a, in a part of the train, and then suddenly, in the middle of it, they would be playing instruments, and then they would be back playing cards, because that did seem to be something that nobody had been doing. So we used two or three little signposts, like the boys suddenly being outside the train, banging on the window trying to get in, just to say to the audience, things are not quite what they seem to be. We didn't concern ourselves with long shot, medium shot, close shot, over shoulder shot, forget it. We just did, just shot the picture the way we went. And whenever uh, something came up, it was in the picture. When George knocked his amp over in, on one of the shows, in the picture. Well, that's what it was about. You know, there's one particular scene that stands out in my mind, uh, which was the game The Genius of John Jimson, was the sequence on the train where John starts to play with the cards and he overlaps the sound before the actual singing starts. I owe the Liverpool Shuffle. And it was the first time that I'd ever seen that on film of preempting the song. And this got you whacked right into the song, and suddenly you felt you were into something also very new again. That was one of the earliest things that John edited, and I was watching him on the movie Ola and seeing him stop and think, which he always did when he cut, he wouldn't do anything immediately like that. But when he did do it, that was it, and I think Pam might agree. I don't remember any alterations to that scene or to many scenes of the actual editing. The construction was John, and that was it. They may have taken out a scene, or shortened it by a certain amount. Well, I had lots of letters from girls all over the world, you know, asking for pieces of their hair, but of course I couldn't, I wish I'd had enough hair to send to them, really, but I couldn't because, you know, it wasn't enough to cut off every week. <laughs> but they, oh, lots of letters I had, yeah. Mm. They didn't like everybody to be seen with it back. They always wanted to, you know, when we washed it, they always wanted, like this, you know, put their hair down in front. They never wanted to see their hair back. Because Ringo has a, a grey streak, he always hated to have that showing, so he used to always bring it forward if anybody came in the room, you know, they'd quickly put their hair down. <laughs> Well, the funny thing was, we made up the routine there and then on the set. And then Dick would say, well, can you do that step, this shot, this angle, that angle? So there was no rehearsal. We did it on the set. And I have to say that I found that wonderful. 
it's much easier. You know what the set's like, you know if there's a step there or anything, and you can choreograph your routine around what you've got. There's so much hanging around while they're setting lights and everything, it was very easy to rehearse. And of course, it didn't give us a chance to forget the steps, we did it there and then. You see, I was never a theatre director. Uh, I was always, uh, 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 the expression is a kick, bollock and scramble man. It's just trying to get myself out of trouble. And I think it's using hysteria to try to con people that exuberance is taking place in front of them is a trick that I learned very early on. And, I, and again, by using a multiple camera technique, I was able to allow people the freedom to move, to go where they want as far as possible. No mark should be given to anybody. No one should have to hit a mark or sit to the center of their chairs. Uh, it was just, you do what you want to do. We'll go out in the field and have a play. And then we would find a way to turn it into a little sequence. The difficulty with this is that some three or four years later, you're asked to go to a film school in Copenhagen or, or Helsinki. And they put that sequence on for the students to watch and then proceed to tell you why you did these shots and what significance they had and it's extremely impolite to tell them the truth and so that, that in the end this kind of myth builds up that you really knew what you were doing and that you had some control over this madhouse i'll show him I watched Dick directing under very tight conditions. In fact, at one point, he said, look, no cameras, nothing, because he wanted peace to be able to complete the shooting. So what I did was I went up into the gantry where the lights were so that I didn't interfere with anybody, and I did some high-angle shots down into the sets quietly. Dad was um, visiting Twickenham Film Studios here and um, he was um, dressed in a pretty formal dark grey suit. And in between fitting the boys' suits for the film, Paul had said to Dick Lester, uh, Dougie's looking very, very tidy this morning. Why don't we let him play himself as the tailor? It took about three quarters of a day shooting, and the reason was this. Although it only lasted a minute and a half, the boys were constantly messing around. Oh, this is the teacher's pet. Shall I shade the class, eh? I'll lay off. His scene was he was measuring Paul. Paul was then moving out of camera. And while my father was still holding the tape measure, John would then say, I now declare this bridge open. Then snip the tape measure and open. That was the official line. But of course, a hundred other lines came up before that, i.e., I now declare this synagogue open or I now declare this fish and chip shop open. So everyone was falling around laughing and each time it had to be retaken and that was the, the state of play that day. I was completely mad in those days, obviously. And uh, I would do a lot of jumping up and looking around and coming down again. <laughs> and then a lot of other people would start jumping. They said, Ringo's going to do whatever you do. And I thought, well, let's see if he can jump as well. Actually, I was trying to keep my eye on my girlfriend at the time, who was Charlotte Rampling, and I could never quite see what she was doing. So I'd, I'd jump up and have a quick look round. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Oh, wait a minute. Don't no, I'm not. Oh, you are. John Lennon was extraordinary. He was an absolute natural actor. And we did the scene, and it was brilliantly written by Alan Owen. You don't look like him at all. The script had us finishing with... John gave me a wink, and I gave him a wink. But, of course, when the film was shown, the winks were cut out. She looks more like him than I do. I had a wife that was a dancer called Prue who's in the film, and she wanted to be an actress. And one of the parts that came up was a screaming teenager in The Hard Day's Night. As I knew Dick Lester, I got her a part. Excuse me, but these young men I'm sitting with wondered if two of us could come over and join you. Then there was a gambling scene, and not very many actors, one had enough money to gamble, or two knew how to handle a spatula, or understood about chemin de fer, or whatever. Hello, monsieur. So I was asked to go along, and and look at this and see if I could do it. I said, yes, I can do it, but I'm not a member of equity. I'm nothing. What have you I'm a businessman. I said, Dick said, don't worry. We'll get you a card, and off you go. And so I did the croupier. Huit et sept. We had at our disposal something like eight or nine songs, which they had just recorded. I eventually chose, I think, seven. 
I don't even remember why at the time I chose those seven and left two out. We did actually shoot one more during the closing concert and I felt this is enough. We're getting tired of this stop. But by and large, if it were a musical sequence, there would be three cameras. With the final concert in Hard Day's Night, there were six. And what was fascinating is that I didn't know six camera operators, uh, and I'd, I had to call on friends and say, who do you know that's good, because we need six to come in and shoot. And they got a pretty free brief. I can tell them the sort of things I'm looking for, but I can't run between six cameras. The, the, a, the sound was deafening, uh, and B, somewhere on the stage, somewhere behind the stage, shooting back into the audience. And it became very much more a, a haphazard style of filmmaking. Dick Lester said, you've got to get stuff when they're playing these numbers. So get a couple of those new 10 to 1 zoom lenses and just do what you think. So it gave us total freedom because you've got to remember that, uh, that in those days there was no video assist or anything like that. You were the director's eyes, you know, you were doing it and nobody else saw it until tomorrow. To be left to your own devices and get really good stuff, it was terrific. You know, pulling focus across guitar strings and all that sort of stuff. We established a style that's still used today when they photograph pop groups. You know, it's the best way of doing it, you know, get all the hand movements and stuff like that. They shot masses of material, as you can imagine, because there were a lot of numbers being covered. And out of it, when it, we went to put it all together, of these six camera operators, we looked at all the material, and in the end, we, one of them, who was a very well-known camera operator, we never used one foot of his film. Whenever something was about to be interesting, he would move off and look for something else. And it, it, was, it was very revealing and very disturbing. One of the other camera operators, it might be interesting to know, was in amongst the girls in the crowd. And at the end of four days shooting, had to be taken in an emergency car to his dentist because all his back teeth had come loose from the intensity of the sound. It was driving me mad. I took a bottle of aspirin almost because, you know, still got to carry on shooting. And I went to the dentist and he said, there's nothing wrong with the tooth. And I said, well, there is. I said, because it's aching. I said, take it out. He reckoned that it was to do with vibration and frequency, something to do with the amalgam vibrating inside your mouth. It was absolute agony. I mean, it really was. The sound was deafening, a high-pitched scream all day once they were let in. And we did a rehearsal. They said, right, camera rehearsal, set up, and Dick had about five cameras going, one coming up here like that handheld. And I turned to, to continue with the scene, and I hit the, the cymbals on the drums. And Ringo said, hey, he's fingering me cymbals. And John immediately said, wonderful line, oh, then he must be a director, because they're famous cymbal fingerers. I suppose that we weren't a completely 100% organised film. It wasn't a detailed script that I was used to, it was a suggestion script. And Dick gave the impression that um, we've got to do something with it. But what, he wasn't always sure of. And one time, the boys went out to play and they started running about on this square. And this helicopter landed and Dick said, oh, let's try and get on the helicopter and go up and shoot this. So I grabbed an Aeroflex and a battery and we stuck a bit of rope across the door and the bloke took us up and when we got there we, I discovered the battery was a worn out battery and the camera started off at 24 frames but it was slowly going to 18, 16, 12, 4 and I thought well the only thing I got, hope I got is to stop the lens down because we're getting more exposure because it's a thing so I stopped the lens down but we didn't say anything to Dick, because we had to come down, that was it. But then the following day, he went to see the rushes, and he came running up to me, and he said, you're a bloody miracle man. He said, how did you do that? He said, well, I said, well, we had the mistake on the battery. So he said, we must get another helicopter and do some fast movement to the boys, which we did. So, I mean, that came as a bit of luck, really. It was never scripted. It works out very well in the film, doesn't it? I suppose you realise this is private property. Sorry we aren't your field, mister. In our price bracket, we didn't even think about colour. The difficulties that there would have been in making that film in colour were not even worth considering, and none of us felt that it was necessary. Our problem was that we shot for seven weeks, which meant that we had three and a half weeks to edit the film, get the music track together, dub it, and get prints for the cinema. And that's a very short period of time. 
our picture was called Beatles Number One because we didn't have a title. And I was getting these phone calls from United Artists in New York, publicity people. So what are we going to call this film? We're putting out the advertising. I said, I don't know. We'll come up with something. And I was bugging them all and the director and the writer and saying, come on, you guys, come up with a title. And we couldn't come up with anything. John and I were just chatting. He asked me if I ever heard Ringo misuse the English language. And I said, well, give me an example. He said, well, if we were working it hard at a recording session all night, the next day he would say something like, boy, that was a hard day's night. And when you think about it, it's a very interesting statement. And I said, John, that's a good title for our movie. And he said, I think so. So we went over and asked the director how he felt and the other Beatles. And they all said, fine, great, great. I think they just wanted to be relieved not to have to think of anything anymore. And I telephoned New York, the publicity people at United Artists, and I said, here's your title, A Hard Day's Not. And they said, what? And I said, don't give me an answer. Ask the secretaries, call me tomorrow. And the next day they called me and said, everybody loved the title. So now we had a title. And then it dawned on me, we didn't have a title song. And we had recorded everything. And you know in filmmaking, you pre-record the songs, and then you photograph the singers singing to their own tracks. So uh, I said to John one night, John, I think we're going to have to have a song called A Hard Day's Night. He said, what are you talking about? I said, what kind of a producer would I be to have a movie called A Hard Day's Night with the Beatles and not have a Beatles song called A Hard Day's Night? Please, you'll have to write a song. The next morning, he and Paul called me into their dressing room. We were still shooting and played and sang to me the song A Hard Day's Night. Now, think about this. I got a hit song on demand. That's almost impossible. It was one of their biggest hits. Uh, when I was asked to do the poster for the film, um, they saw some material that the United Artists New York Publicity Office presented in London, and they didn't like it. Walter didn't like it. Dick didn't like it. Peter didn't like it because it was sort of cartoons with wigs, and I didn't feel that reflected what the Beatles really were. So Walter said, well, look, can you come up with anything? So I said, what about doing a sequence of photographs of each individual so that there's a feeling of animation from each individual Beatle? And I was very happy with the result, both of the poster and of the end credits. So we used very simple techniques to get something that I think was graphically effective. Out of kindness, because we only had a few days before we had it in the cinema, we showed it to the executives who flew in. One of them did say, as you knew they would say, it's fine, but we have to revoice the voices because nobody will understand them. That was absolute truth, and most of them agreed with it. We've become a limited company. And, and I threw a fit, and so it didn't happen. Whenever you make a film and you show it to strangers for the first time, you are apprehensive, and it was silent, and it was a small cinema in, in London. And I was sitting next to a person who I didn't know, and we were... The first reel goes on, and they're on the train, and I suddenly, I hear... And I, on my right is my editor, and I think, yeah, John, I, it, I think it is going on a bit too long there. You know, I think we, maybe we can uh, cut a bit out of there, because I, you know... And the next reel goes on, and, the, and, and something happens, and she goes... Maybe we could cut a verse out of that song and reduce it, because... You know. Well, it went on for nine reels. At the end of it, the lights went up, and this woman turned to me and said, Oh, Mr. Lester, that movie of yours... <laughs> that was her high praise, so I went, I said to John, well, you know, throw that away, forget about it. I can very clearly remember the first time the film was screened in the United States. The top management of United Artists, Krim Benjamin and the two pickers were in Los Angeles. There was a dinner being given at the home of Harold Mirisch. And Harold Mirisch was a producer of, of repute. And he had invited the power core of United Artists Hollywood established group. Billy Wilder and John Sturgis and Blake Edwards and uh, who else? And I told Arthur Krim, the print of Hard Day's Night is here. And Harold Mirisch was in the room. So Harold said, well, why don't you screen at my house after dinner? I said, Harold, we're not going to screen this picture the first time in America after dinner with Billy Wilder and yes it'll be great don't worry about it you know these guys know their movies bottom line is we have the dinner couches are turned around and the 
Otrillo or the Picasso goes up into the ceiling and we screen Hard Day's Night. It was not a long movie. I don't remember exactly how long, but it was not a long movie. And this very exotic movie is on the screen. And it ends in this utter silence. Nobody knows what to say because they've never seen a movie like this. And Bob Benjamin, who was Arthur's other half, Arthur Grimm's other half, wonderfully soft-spoken, dear man, turns around to me and he said, I don't know what that was about, but I think we're going to make a lot of money. <laughs> and that was the first screening of Hard Day's Night in the United States. Johnny Jim's cut the picture as we went. And, and when it was finished, I mean, UA was screaming for Prince because, you know, by then it was all out that the Beatles were great. In between the shooting of the movie and the actual premiere, which I think was in July, um, there was oh, a myriad of different stories about the Beatles. The Beatles were in the papers every day because don't forget that by now uh, there had been an outbreak, an epidemic of Beatlemania in America as well as here and in Australia and on the continent. So the thing had gone global. The slightest thing that happened made enormous headlines. There were twin premieres for the movie in, of course, in Liverpool. It had to be in Liverpool and a West End of London. And it wasn't any great surprise that the media covered that to saturation. And it wasn't any great surprise to find that the fans turned out in amazing numbers, blocked the traffic in London's West End, blocked the traffic outside the, the Odeon Theatre in, in, in Liverpool. Um, but what was a very pleasant surprise to all of us was that the... The film critics, the more serious film critics, as well as the kind of um, music writers, the pop writers, the rock journalists, that the, the serious film critics um, took the film seriously and uh, began to talk in terms of um, the actual film value. We had a screening in Liverpool and I had a chat with Paul before and he was very nervous about going to Liverpool. And I said, they're going to love it. They're going to love you. They're going to love the movie. And he said, we haven't been up there since we made it. And they may resent the fact that we're coming home so successful. And the others were worried about it. Somehow or other, they felt um, that the, their, their people would resent their success. And of course, they just loved them when they got there. It was almost impossible for me uh, to predict the audience reaction to this movie. The Beatles had screaming fans whenever they performed in a concert. But that was in response to a live performance. And I didn't realize that the fans would respond the same way to them on film. But an early clue to the amount of enthusiasm from Beatle fans was the night of the performance for Princess Margaret in Piccadilly Circus when there were thousands and thousands of people. Um, and I was told it was like VE Day. And obviously when royalty attends uh, a, a premiere of a film, uh, there's a lot of protocol. It was such an exciting, happy period. It was a wonderful premiere. People came, they shouted, we had worked very carefully that it was very important that the opening of the film would be that one chord. And then out of the blackness came them running down the street. And at the premiere, they had the mighty Wurlitzer organ of the London Pavilion. And a guy rose up and played Beatles hits on the mighty Wurlitzer organ, at which point the lights in the cinema dimmed and the film is about to start, but he hadn't finished his song, so they took the sound off the film, so the, the, there was no chord, and people started running, while he was still finishing off a, a few songs, and then slowly he descended, smiling and waving. So, you know, it started off well. I think everybody was just kind of stunned by it, because it was such an anti-Hollywood type movie. I mean, they didn't know Dick Lester really, and the style of this movie, the talking into the camera, the, the, the whole thing about it, the, the irreverence of it, all of it, and these kids themselves, who they'd heard of, obviously, was kind of stunned them, because the movie is really a very unusual experience, and certainly breaks every rule that, you know, even the best of the Hollywood movies followed. Uh, nobody disliked it, but nobody had expected what they saw. Come at you lot, try to act with a bit of decorum. This is a posh place. We know how to behave, we've had lessons. 
Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Members and invited guests only. Ah, well, uh... Oh, yes. It was a happy film. Everybody enjoyed it, even mums and dads. And there were a couple of Academy Award nominations. One was for Alan Owen, most deservedly, because he wrote the original script. The other was for me, rather undeservedly. But I, I was given a, an Academy Award nomination for my work in directing the music. There was such an aura about them, and they, were, they had such a, an, an impact on everyone's lives that uh, I think the exuberance just carried us on. And I was just lucky to be part of it. And because of it, I was sent a parchment scroll, which I think you know the story. I was uh, told that I was the father of MTV, and I wrote back and demanded a blood test. Hard Day's Night is simply a classic example of what happens when enlightened management gives brilliant talent the ability to create. I think the film actually widened the horizons of the Beatles. I mean, they'd been very successful from their small beginnings. They'd really conquered the world by this time. But the film set the seal on it because it brought them a wider audience, it brought them a wider range of ages and made everyone realize that these weren't just fly-by-nights. They were great talents. I arrived in England after about a year at the time when commercial television was just beginning. And there was another country with filled with people who knew nothing about the business. And I was, had this enormous stretch of experience going back whew, a year, <laughs> at two years. Uh, so I, I was hired provided that I would teach other directors how to direct for television. And, uh, so I did, and one of the first people I met, because I'd done a program on the air which was so appalling that it made no sense whatsoever, and I had a phone call um, from a man who said, you probably don't know me, but I saw your program last night. It was either the worst thing I have ever seen on British television, or you may be onto something. And I said, well, if there's a choice, I'll take the latter. And he said, would you like lunch? And I said, fine. And it was Peter Sellers. And we ended up doing three series of, of TV goon shows. Nothing is left of them because the people who provided the money for the programs knew that it would cost 75 pounds to record them uh, with a telerecording process. We then decided the, what we could do. Peter, Peter was a great enthusiast for all toys. He used to have a, a different car every week and he would buy the latest cameras. So he bought uh, a new Pirate Bull X 16mm camera and we went out into a field with our friends and in a day and a half shot a short film. And I won't go into it, but, but through a series of accidents, uh, this film which cost 70, 70 pounds to make was nominated for an Academy Award. So I suddenly thought, well, I'm, I'm now a film director and nobody called for two or three years and then uh, I was able to do a pop musical which and the Beatles happened to have seen a running jumping and standing still film which was the short film and the pop musical and and so when we were introduced to each other uh, they felt they could trust me to produce that same sort of useless amateurism that, that, that they'd noticed before so out of that we we then started to work I don't think it ever occurred to us to ask the Beatles to play the Musketeers, to be anything but themselves. We tried to produce an ambiance where they were familiar and that they felt comfortable. They had done press conferences. They knew that sense of being in rooms. John Lennon did say in 1963, I said, you'd just come back from Sweden, how was it? And he said it was a car in a room and a room and a car and a cheese sandwich. And that very much was what the whole first half of Hard Day's Night was set out to do. It was deliberately shot in, in real places with low, genuinely low ceilings and people were always at them and nagging them and for the whole first two, third maybe more of the film 
it was important that they were being hounded and told what to do and where to go so that it, there's a certain moment when they break out and refuse and, and run down the fire escapes and go into a field and just be idiots. That sense of relief was what we were trying to do and that was cut with uh, the music of Count Buy Me Love and it, it's when the film begins to take off. I wanted it to be as natural an experience for them as possible. And the one thing that we always felt that was important was that we tried to delineate their personalities artificially because there was always that sense, especially in being with them, that they were four parts of a marriage, that they were very protective and very close and very like each other. And that to, to help out, um, it was important to create artificially that George was mean, that Paul was the cute one, that John was the cynic, and that Ringo was up the back and unloved. I are the Liverpool Shuffle. There's a very glib definition of surrealism in that, that surrealism is the point at which two concentric circles of reality meet. In other words, you could have chorus girls and U-boat commanders going down a spiral metal staircase. The, the point at which they're both on the same stair rung is that, that point of, that's surreal. Or verbally, um, what's our course, Captain Prunes and Custard? You know, course is the point at which surrealism starts and ends. The one that was, people often ask, um, because occasionally I do get asked about the Beatles from time to time, uh, that I think was the most accurate performer was George, because he never attempted too much or too little, but he always was right in the center. You know, it's like Ella Fitzgerald, whatever note she hit, it was always an absolutely in the center of the note. Uh, she just couldn't not, she would, she'd, she'd die. And George was always, he, he got out of the scene everything there was to get out of it. There wasn't a lot for him to do, but whatever he had to do, he did very well. Right, on your way. You are. You heard. On your way, troublemaker. I, th I think there was always the sense, uh, and it was so easy to portray physically, it's that Ringo was the one up the back that nobody looks at, um, and he's just holding the band together. And I think, strangely enough, I think he was a much better. I, I'm not a drummer. I've never. I, I've never been a drummer. I, I will. I, I don't even have to take the fifth. Um, but he. I think he was a better drummer than a lot of people give give credit to because he was pretty solid. He, he seemed to hold on to what w was necessary. But it was an easy game to play, that he was the one that was feeling that the, he lacked respect and that, that nobody really paid much attention to him. And of course, he had a lugubrious ex expression permanently. And he did have the, the ability to come up with the most asinine non sequiturs. I mean, he was he that invented the title, It's a Hard Day's Night, I'm sure everybody knows, and came up with the title for the second film, which was Eight Arms to Hold You, and thank God we didn't have to use it in the end. Hi, Norm. Hi, John. John! Did you want something? Oh, I could eat the lot of you. You look great with an apple in your gob. Well, I always think that John is one of the three or four most interesting people I've ever met, and I've, I've been blessed with having met a lot of fairly well-known people, both in regal and political circumstances. But, the, but John was, I think, unique in that he suffered fools very badly, and he was quick-witted and quickly cynical hated pomposity and hated people in authority who treated them as hired servants. I mean, he was a man that, that threw a grudge quickly and then disposed of it, and then you would get on and get on and do the next work. Uh, he just said what he felt, uh, and it was, it was refreshing, and he, he pricked all our bubbles of pomposity, and people like that are sorely needed. Oh, that this tutu's solid flesh would melt. Zap! I think with Paul, Paul was the most theatrical of them all. He had a, a girlfriend who was an actress. Um, she and her parents and her brother went to the theater a lot. Paul went with her. He loved the theater. He loved show business, as it were, in a way that the other three really didn't care. I think this was 
a disadvantage to him that I think in a way sometimes Paul tried too hard to act um, in the nicest possible way because you know Paul Paul was always very willing and, and has remained a lovely lovely guy and but I think that had he been less enamored with the trappings of cinema and, and the theater, he, he might have been a bit more relaxed. Well, why don't we do the show right here? Yeah! <laughs> Two, three, four. I think they were so relieved that it wasn't, hey kids, let's do the show right here, that, uh, th that they were being unnecessarily kind. And I think that we, they were swept up, and we were all swept up, in the exuberance of the moment, of the fact that they were four boys who could stand up for themselves and and be amusing to order. That sense of how they protect each other, how they were loyal to each other, how they, they cushioned themselves against the realities of the outside world that sometimes treated them with, with dreadful condescension. So in that respect, we just, I did my best to hold that and put it on film. I think they liked it. I think they liked it. I think they and I, we were just relieved we all got away with it. They weren't too disappointed. I, don't, I, I think to this day we have never talked about it or about anything that they did. John said about help, I, I'm a, and I cannot use the language as he described it, but I'm an extra in my own mm -mm film. Um, and I know what he meant. Uh, there was a series of circumstances we didn't have a lot of choice. But I think that's the entire amount of comment and criticism and, and constructive uh, uh, commitment that, we, that, that the five of us have ever had. When we showed it for the first time, and United Artists were a very liberal and far-thinking company, in which by and large they would say to people they trusted, this is the amount of money you have, we'll see you at the premiere. There was such an aura about them, and were, they had such a, an, an impact on everyone's lives that uh, I think the exuberance just carried us on. And I was just lucky to be part of it. I, uh, when asked 10, 20 years later, what were the 60s like, it said, don't ask me, I was at the center of the universe. You know, it, it was just so wonderful that um, you, know, you really didn't know. You, there was no way to be objective about what was going on. If you have three weeks to cut, edit, dub, mix, check a print on a film, you have no time whatsoever for thinking, I have achieved aesthetic greatness. I think when we made Hard Day's Night, we knew that they were wonderful and that I really enjoyed their music. As to their longevity, I had never thought about it, didn't worry about it. We knew that by contract we had to get the film out quickly. The reason that was so was because United Artists thought that they would be, see, would be a, a one-month wonder. I think that uh, in terms of gratitude, I owe them a lot more than they owe me. They gave me a film career for, for, for starts. That's what the Beatles gave me. Um, I, I was able to trade on that for about 40 years. So all I did was to try to make sure that they were presented in a way that was respectful um, and as honest as it could be and as close to what I think they would have liked to have made as a film. At the end of the 50s, um, a new streak of humour, new vein of humour, appeared in England. And it was, it was crazy, it was silly, it was anarchic, and it was, became enormously popular. It led to, to a a show called The Goons, which featured Peter Sellers, Spike Milligan, Harry Seacombe, and originally Michael Benteen. And uh, it was a radio show. And Peter Sellers in those days was a radio star. He, he started as a stooge to Ted Ray in Raise a Laugh, and he yet, and he still wasn't a film star. And that's when I first met him. And I started making records with him at that time, because I loved what they were all doing. And Dick Lester also, was interested in this kind of humour. And he teamed up with them to make a very, very crazy film indeed. And that was a kind of prototype of A Hard Day's Night. 
when the Beatles first came into Abbey Road Studios, um, I was a little bit skeptical about what the outcome would be. Uh, but they, st I, I liked their personalities, and uh, they were quite, quite respectful and quite. And I, they had actually were a bit nervous because they were worried how I was going to receive them. I was a kind of, well, I was a boss figure, obviously, and I was obviously a kind of headmaster figure, if you like, to them. And they were a little bit twitchy. And I did a take with them, but I was trying to sort out who was going to be, frankly, who was going to be the lead singer, because I was still thinking in terms of Cliff and the Shadows. I was still wondering how I was going to handle this group of four. And I said, come into the control room and have a listen to what we've been doing. And as they came in, I said, look, listen to it. Uh, tell me if there's anything you don't like. And George Harrison bravely came up and said, I don't like your tie for a start. And, I <laughs> and of course, the others fell around and laughed at him, but they, they pummeled him and they thought, that, they thought he was going to blow it, you know, because I'd be offended. Of course, I, was, I thought it was remarkably cheeky and very funny too. It wasn't a bad tie, actually. <laughs> The, the amount of time I got with the Beatles was minimal because by this time they were on their golden treadmill and that meant that they were appearing all over the world, rushing from hotel room to hotel room for various performances, various shows, slotted in between television shows, radio shows, interviews with the press. Their life was merciless actually and I was begging Brian, I said, look, if you want records out, you've got to give me time with them. And I was allocated maybe an afternoon or a day here and an evening or whatever there. So I didn't get very much time with them. When I did, I concentrate on, on stockpiling material for the next album or whatever it was. And this was the case before A Hard Day's Night began. And Dick Lester came to me and said, what have you got that I can have in the film? And I had already quite a few titles. Um, and now once the film started, John and Paul wrote some special songs for the, for the film as well. Um, if I Fell was one of them, for example. There, there, were, there were several, I think four or five. Um, but they just blossomed from being, in my opinion, not very interesting musical people to begin with, into suddenly geniuses. Uh, and they, they work very hard, and they work very well under pressure. Very young men, don't forget, they're in their early 20s. Paul was 21, perhaps. And all the immense challenges that were presented to them resulted in great stuff. And they worked very quickly, and we had to work quickly to capture them. So um, the songs were written with a minimum of fuss, and John and Paul were, were kind of tended to go their own ways, tended to write their own songs at this time, but they still, they still helped each other out. And I, we, I will be recording just like uh, a live broadcast. We weren't doing multi-track work. We weren't overdubbing voices incessantly. Um, the, the very first album I did was, in fact, like a, like a radio show. And I had them in the studios from morning till night and recorded the whole album in one day. But so that this was the tradition which they faced when they came to write and record the music for A Hard Day's Night. They knew we wanted them quickly, and they were ex expected. The media do tend to pigeonhole people, and in, certainly in the case of Hard Day's Night, I'm afraid we did get the various characters and the Beatles stereotyped, um, which was a little bit... I mean, it still goes on to this day that Paul was the softy and, George, and John was the rocker. Um, and that wasn't true, you know, because you think of Paul writing Helder Skelter, can you imagine a more rocky song than that? And John with this soft stuff, like Julia, and imagine and so on. I'd like more drums there. No, I think it's on that. It the sounds other like a on the other cover, bit. Right on, on the third bit, you know, no, the third, third bit. bit okay. more bang. Bang. I guess I was feeling pretty smug. <laughs> Basically, because uh, most people think that I signed the Beatles to their music. I didn't. I signed the Beatles. You know, in January 62, I first saw Brian, and I said, I don't think much of what you're offering me. And in fact, if this is it, I'll turn you down. I said, but I will give you the chance of bringing them down to London, and I will take them through the motions in the studio. And he did that. And when I came down to London, I listened to them. I played around with our sounds. 
met them, and I thought they were terrific. Not as musicians, but as people. They had this wonderful charisma, and that's what made me sign them. It was their personalities that made me sign them. And uh, the one guy who didn't come over tr too well was the guy who on drums, because he was very quiet and almost sullen. And I'm afraid we got rid of him. But the other three were fantastic. And when Ringo was added to them, they became even better. And I think they had that feeling. You know when you, you're, you meet someone and you warm to them, and you like being with them, and they give you a kind of glow. Uh, and when they leave you, you feel a little bit uh, lost because they left you. The Beatles had that effect on me. And I thought, well, if they have that effect on me, they're going to be a success because they'll have that effect on people. And of course, the Beatles on the film were able to give that impression also. They were able to project that part of their charisma to the audience which is why the film was a success.